Welcome, everyone. My name is Gretchen Gopani, so I'm a licensed social worker. If, if everyone can put themselves on mute so we can hear, that'd be wonderful. My name is Gretchen Gropani. I'm a licensed social worker here at the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation at Boston University. I'm going to be today's moderator for our Making Sense of Employment Research webinar. Okay. The event is funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, we shouldn't hear you. We have to ask. There we are. You need to unmute, uh, yeah, Gretchen. Okay. Here I, all right. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be transcribed and posted on our center's website. We acknowledge that the territory on which Boston University stands is that of the Wampanoag and Massachusetts people. We do this land acknowledgement as a way of inviting truth to our conversation over the next hour. We ask that you please keep yourselves on mute over the next hour and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the PowerPoint presentation. So just post your questions in the chat box as they arise. Our webinar today is titled Long-Term Unemployment, the Social Determinant Under-Addressed Within Community Behavioral Health Programs. Be led by Joe Marone, who is a recently retired senior program manager for public policy at the Institute for Community Inclusion, UMass Boston. He's also coordinator and of training and TA at the voc rehab, excuse me, Vocational Rehabilitation and VR Management, RRTCs, based at ICI. Currently, he is consulting with the BURRTC on the provision of remote online TA. He has also been a deputy administrator of a large CMHC in Washington, as well as having a 17-year career in public VR. Welcome, Joe. I'm going to pass it over to you now for your presentation. Hi there. Thank you, Gretchen. Hello, everybody. Hi there. Here in uh, Portland, Oregon, where it's beautiful, 71 degrees, soon to be 110 later in the week. So uh, luckily, we're doing it today, so I keep the fans off. Um, I wanted to let me share the screen, and I'll, I'm going to... Uh, Keep it pretty much to uh, 45 minutes, and then we'll have uh, 12 minutes or so for questions. But if you have something burning before, you can break in through the chat box or unmute yourself. But otherwise, keep muted for the background noise. Appreciate it. Let me share my screen now. And let's see. There we are. There we are. Um, I changed. Uh, the order what I originally sent Gretchen, you'll have the correct order because because we only have a few minutes. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I, in journalism parlance, we didn't bury the lead. So the first probably five or six slides is in some extent, to some extent, the, the, the basic issue. And the rest is really some background and some, some filler and some rationale for it. But uh, the first slide, which is the title, um, if you think work is bad for people with mental illness, what about poverty? Unemployment and Social Isolation is an article I wrote going back 30 years ago. Or so, And basically, for many years, I think it's become a little less so recently, but it's still a major issue. The work has sort of been seen as a boutique issue in terms of mental health systems, and that people have to be very concerned about should they work, should they, should they not work? What about some issues around people having too much stress? And I think what we found over the year, what I know we found over the years is essentially that people with uh, any issues, whether they have a disability or not, are often harmed more by long-term unemployment than by stresses of employment, although there's some variations on that. Uh, here's my contact information, which you probably have seen, but anyway, uh, my cell phone is 503-490-2072, and my email is joseph.maroney at gmail.com. So if you have any specific questions or whatever that don't get dealt with here, feel free to connect. 
via email or my cell phone. I'm not big on cartoons, but this kind of gets to it. This is a cartoon from years ago. And there's people talking together, uh, supposedly clinical folks saying he's obviously depressed. Let's label him and see if several years of unemployment and poor relationships helps his condition. Well, this is meant to be sort of snarky and, and sort of not even that funny, but snarky about kind of traditional mental health. The reality is that a lot of this attitude, at least behind this, still exists in mental health. Uh, so there are a couple of things that, uh, that I think are just frame anything I'll say over the whole 40, 45 minutes. For many years, I used to do a lot of keynote speaking and, and I wouldn't call it inspirational, but kind of broad-based keynote speaking. And it would be sort of a version of people with disabilities are just like you and me, look beyond the label, you know, that kind of sort of roughly speaking anti-stigma discussions. Probably 20 years or so, longer than that, 25 years ago, when we started talking about employment, I started saying, how does this frame out in terms of specifically about employment? And I finally came to this, to some extent, overly simplistic, but still accurate concept, which is that if I think people with disabilities, including psychiatric disabilities, can work, then I think people should work. Then I think of it as a citizenship responsibility. And how we, we get to that point is not the same for everybody. Some people need nurturing. Some people need a maybe a kick in the rear end. Some people need nagging. Some people uh, need a lot more time to come to this. But I really do believe that ultimately recovery and citizenship are basically intertwined. And if people can work, which I think everybody can work, despite whatever label that gets put on them, that people should work. Um, People, you've heard a lot, I'm sure, particularly because you, you've signed up for this webinar, you know that, that there's a lot of discussion probably over the last five years about employment being a social determinant of health. And that's true as far as it goes. But I think what's important to understand is we're really going to be talking about the negative impact of long-term unemployment. So essentially, it's important to remember that remaining unemployed is worse for you than being employed is good for you. I think that's often lost. As, a, as an old rehab person and as an old, um, in, in every step of the way, let me say a veteran and an older uh, person who's been involved in the, in the psychiatric rehabilitation field for going on 40 years now, I certainly have spent a lot of time talking about the virtues of employment. And I think that's, that's still accurate. However, I, what's really going to be the focus of, of today is really talking about how the fact that remaining unemployed is worse for you than being employed is good for you is really underappreciated and underreferenced, certainly in the literature and in day-to-day -day discussion. Avoiding long-term unemployment is a better option than waiting for an ideal or perfect job. And I have to have two caveats with that, though, particularly in today's political climate. Number one, the fact that I say long-term unemployment is worse for you than being employed is good for you does not mean that every specific job is good for you. Some very some jobs can, in fact, be very bad for a person's physical and mental health. So the negative effects on one's physical and well -well -be well mental well-being of being unemployed likely outweigh the positive value of any one job for any one individual. So that's kind of a convoluted way of saying that some jobs are not always good for you, but being unemployed a long time is almost always bad for you. And once again, in terms of today's often political debates, when I say people should work, what I do not mean is that you should make employment a requirement for getting things like health care or food support. Those are necessary supports to help people move ahead in employment. So you can't use them or you really shouldn't use them as barriers to people seeking employment. Uh, but it's easier said than done. And as I often say that all change is difficult, no matter how long you put it off. Uh, and the reason why it's important to, to think about this is here's some current stats uh, from our current U.S. mental health system. And I know that not everybody here is in the U.S., but it really doesn't change that much if you look at some of the international figures. But these figures are figures counted that are, are um, 
in the U.S., it's called the Substance Abuse and Mental Health um, uh, uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which is part of our federal bureaucracy, overseeing a lot of the the funding models that fund on a, a basically what we call block grants to state mental health authorities. So through fiscal 2020, which is the last year we have, only a little less than 24% of people in the adult mental health system have any have had any kind of employment during fiscal year 2020. People looking for work or not employed, less than 50%. So over 50% of people in the adult mental health system are not even looking for employment. And over 77, 76% of adults in our current mental health system don't have any employment in the previous year. And for those folks who think about uh, what we know about evidence-based important employment, fewer than 2% of adults in the population, in the adult mental health population in the US even have access to evidence-based supported employment. So we're talking about the fact that, well, you can say simply that unemployment's bad for you. The reality is that Long-term unemployment is a state that most adults with serious mental illness in the U.S. and, frankly, internationally still face. And it's a serious health problem. It's not just a social problem or an economic problem. It's a serious health problem. So <clears throat> the reason I, I present some of those figures is that you've often heard the phrase, what gets measured gets done. But that's not totally true. I like to say until something gets measured and gained, it doesn't begin to get done. One of the dilemmas of these figures, these what I would see as a major health crisis in the U.S. Uh, adult mental health population, is that in general, most people, if you go to a local mental health system, if you go to a Iowa or Massachusetts or, or Connecticut or, or, or Washington State, most administrators at the state level in mental health or at the local level, don't even know these numbers. They know kind of it's a general problem. They don't know the numbers because the numbers aren't important enough that people, what I call, game the system. They don't try to fudge the system because there isn't enough uh, effort played on improving those numbers. Uh, Ruby, who some of you might have heard, was a poet from several hundred years ago who said, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. So today I'm a wise, so I've begun to change myself. And John Cage, who's a much more uh, current composer or uh, musical composer in the US says, I can't understand why people are frightened of new ideas. I'm frightened of the old ones. And then um, you hear a lot about recovery these days over the last 20 years, which is very good. You know, we're not talking about uh, mental health treatment just, we're not talking about just clinical improvement. We're trying to talk about recovery. And recovery, you often hear of recovery is a personal journey. But if you don't get anywhere, it can become a treadmill. And remaining unemployed is a classic case of not getting very far in terms of recovery, in my point of view. Um, now, this seminar is basically about employment and work. So I think when I think about work, I don't just think about productivity, although being productive is certainly important, uh, but it's not necessarily the most important part of life for everyone. There are other things in life that hopefully keep people uh, uh, vibrant and, and, and make life worth living in a sense. Uh, relationships, family, spirituality, recreation, uh, 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 hobbies. The reason I focus on employment and work is that it may not be the most important part of life, but, but it's the stuff that we in human services, particularly psychiatric human services, are least successful in helping our constituency, the people we're supposed to help achieve. And when I say not just productivity, what I mean is that volunteering, for example, is often a good individual strategy for people. It's often very helpful for people to, to get a sense of giving back to try something out, to not, to not just be a recipient of service, but be someone who helps other people. So that's certainly a very valid individual way of being productive. But when we talk about human service systems, we need to talk about employment as different than volunteering. Volunteering may be good individually, clinically, but it's not the same as employment. 
I often, when I, I deal with system change, I often hear people, when they talk about statistics, want to lump in paid work and volunteering as the same outcome. They're not the same outcomes. They both may be important, but they're not the same outcomes. Uh, some of you may have, uh, hopefully a lot of you know of or have heard Pat Deegan, who's probably the most um, fantastic and, and probably one of the most influential uh, people with lived experience uh, speakers in, in, the, in the world, really, not just in the U.S. And she's someone who's had their own story uh, of lived experience and then became a PhD psychologist. But she's a wonderful speaker and author and poet. She doesn't talk a lot about employment necessarily, but when she does talk about it, this is from an international conference from 16 years, 17 years ago, life lived within the confines of the human service and rehabilitation landscapes is a life in which the freedom to become and make your own future is diminished. And that's my concern, frankly. Uh, as, as a U.S. citizen and as a citizen of the world, I... I well, I, you know, it's certainly valid for people to worry about things like budget and people, um, human services, uh, uh, cost of human services and taking money away from other things that need to be done, like uh, climate change or, or economic development. That's not my concern about long term unemployment and people in the mental health system. My concern is that people who live their lives within the confines just of, of rehabilitation or human services, it, are in fact often uh, circumscribing their lives in a way they don't need to be circumscribed. And there's a lot of virtues to avoiding long-term unemployment. Um, now, part of the problem when you do a, um, uh, you know, a fairly short webinar like this is you're talking these, the, these broad terms and it's easy for people to say, well, I know that, oh, I'm already doing that. You often have people say, oh, I'm already doing that. We've tried that or we tried that 15 years ago or 18 years ago, or I hear people say, um, we've offered employment to anybody who chooses employment, but most of our clients don't feel ready or aren't interested in employment. So my concern, if everybody's already doing it, how come it doesn't get done? Because it's not getting done, as you can see from these statistics. If we're saying we value employment and are trying to help people avoid long-term unemployment, and we see long-term unemployment as a clinical risk factor that mental health systems and human service systems must help people confront. We're clearly not doing a good enough job with that. Uh, basically, I'm gonna focus more on employment, but when I talk about outcomes for recovery-oriented recovery mental health system, I think about employment educational outcomes. I think about housing outcomes. I think about, it's clearly important to think about helping people avoid more distress that sometimes symptoms can cause or self-injurious behavior. I think about community participation and citizenship. I think about helping people lessen their need for outside financial support because that's always makes you dependent on the whims of uh, the political whims or, or social whims. And I'm also talking about how people are satisfied with their own lives and how people are satisfied with what you bring them. So these are broad-based outcomes that I think we need to think about, not just employment. We're really going to focus on the employment piece because I, I really think that combating unemployment is an area that really has not been dealt with uh, very strongly. And when we talk about employment as a social determinant of health, you're going to see references, and there'll be more references that you'll have for takeaway and, and uh, handouts that Gretchen will put in the chat box in, in a bit. But what's important to understand that I'm not just saying that employment is good for you. What I'm really saying is that long-term unemployment is very bad for you, and there is a, a basically a clinical responsibility by people involved in any facet of the psychiatric rehabilitation or the mental health system to deal with combating long-term unemployment as a clinical risk factor for people. It's not just a nice outcome once other things are taken care of. It's a clinical risk factor. And I also don't want you to get trapped in this kind of hokey kind of stuff that you hear people say, what's the first thing people ask you about at a party about? That's not the reason to deal with it. 
The reason to deal with long-term unemployment is that remaining unemployed is one of the worst things you can do for your physical and mental health. Um, and practically, to some extent, well, I can, I can get as cosmic as the next person in terms of the social benefit of psychiatric rehabilitation, adult mental health. Ultimately, I see becoming a better person and self-realization is the, the consumer is the person, the recipient's responsibility. When we in the, the public mental health system, behavioral health system, really have a fiduciary responsibility to do is to help people get employed, get housing, stay out of the hospital and jail, and reduce symptom impact. And those are all what I see as primary staff responsibilities as we create partnerships with the person. I'm talking about partnerships. I'm talking about um, ways to, that a staff person should influence people to improve their lives, not control people, but the ways people getting paid by the system to help people deal with serious mental illness, influence people to move ahead in their lives and provide this kind of support they need. And I'll, I'll talk in a bit about um, what I see as a difference between just helping people and supporting people. Terry Pratchett, who's a children's author said, I'd be more enthusiastic about encouraging thinking outside the box when there's evidence of any thinking going on inside it. So I don't want you to think necessarily they have to be super creative. I want you to think about how concrete you can be about dealing with people when they're facing the major clinical issues inherent in long-term unemployment. I wrote an article that I mentioned, this goes back, I guess, 21 years now, about why should people work? And to some extent, I hadn't fully crystallized my conception of long-term unemployment. But in terms of um, why people should work, and it had that title that we started with, if you think work is bad for people with mental illness, what about unemployment, social isolation, and poverty? Unemployment is much, much worse for your mental health than the stresses of employment. I see employment, frankly, as part of citizenship, and I see recovery and citizenship as both part of the deal. Work is not enough, but it's a better start on the American dream than unemployment and poverty. And I understand, as I hope all of you do, whether you're in the U.S., Canada, overseas, that there are a lot of people who work very hard and are still poor because of various economic systems and economic realities. So this is not a magical solution to people moving out of poverty because there are people who, at least in the U.S., who work two jobs and are still suffering from poverty. I don't have the magical solution, but I know that remaining unemployed is not the best way out of poverty. I think there's a lot of the emphasis on discovery and career profiling and person-centered planning, and those are all great. But ultimately, beginning the journey towards employment is more likely to create, lead to a career than just planning about it. You need to take some action to begin moving ahead. Frankly, if you're a 20-year-old person who's unemployed, it doesn't get easier to become employed or to move ahead in your life when you're 40. Uh, while employment is stressful and often episodic, you know, we hear a lot about the gig economy. We know what's happened during the pandemic. It's often, over the long haul, a much less stressful way of life than depending on Social Security or, or TANF. And for those folks not in the U.S., uh, SSI and SSDI are two versions of our Social Security uh, income benefit system, one for people who have been employed, one for essentially people who have been unemployed. TANF is what we used to call our, our uh, AFDC or basically our welfare system for, for uh, unemployed, often unemployed, although they can be employed, unemployed or poor parents with children. I think it certainly gives more status than a consumer of mental health systems. That's not necessarily right, but it, 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 it's something people can relate to. You know, most people are employed. So people can relate to you as a worker much easier than they can relate to a person as a consumer of the mental health system, even if they have very positive views about mental illness or substance abuse. Frankly, particularly in our current society, it's a lot easier way to meet people and expand networks and develop possibilities for intimacy, love, and sex. We just don't have the kind of social fabric that we had 100 years ago. 
We move around a lot more. Uh, we're not as connected with neighbors as we were. Our families are not necessarily close together anymore. My, I have uh, grandkids in Michigan and in uh, uh, outside of Washington, D.C., so it's it's not as easy to, to create a social network as it might have been 100 years ago where people were rooted in one place with their family constellation all around. And certainly one of the primary ways we meet friends, family, lovers, uh, people who become family, lovers, good friends, associates. And on a practical level, it, hopefully, although not, not always, depending on the job, it's much more interesting day to day and it gives leisure more meaning. Uh, there was a recent article in the Washington Post who said, uh, sort of obviously, I guess, that prolonged and inescapable boredom has serious negative consequences. And while some jobs and some repetitive jobs can be terribly boring, being at home all day can often be terribly boring. Relying on, on day services or just treatment at a mental health center can be terribly boring and usually much less intellectually stimulating, excuse me, and, and um, interesting than just the working with coworkers and connecting with customers in a job. Uh, as I said, and that's kind of the theme for this, that unemployment is really bad for you. What uh, Gretchen has, let me see if in the chat box now. Hold on a second. Gretchen will put if she hasn't put already. I, I think she does. Uh, I have several handouts, but one of the key handouts is a handout of references. Excuse me. It's a handout of references. And in that, you'll see over 100 epidemiological references that don't prove causation between long-term unemployment and physical and mental health, but there's a very strong correlation. And what you have in the next few slides is some samples. These are included in that longer handout. But while we don't have a strict uh, causative, cause and effect basis, there is a, a, an enormous amount of data that certainly indicate a direction that says, even in the absence a pre-existing physical or mental uh, problems or, 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 or uh, uh, pathology that in fact, long-term unemployment may cause or certainly exacerbate, exacerbate existing, issue, existing health issues, whether physical or psychological. So here's some samples from that handout. Uh, Margaret Park, who uh, was a, a, a person with lived experience, wrote, this is uh, probably 10 years ago now, I forgot the year. Mental health professionals believed I could not work and I believed them, I trusted them. Unemployment is itself a boring and depressing experience. It takes herculean effort to not be overwhelmed by a sense of meaninglessness. There's uh, other sections of her quote talking about being judged by others, not being able to, to um, be respected by friends for good or bad reasons. That's not necessarily good from a, a social construct that people shouldn't respect you because you're unemployed, but it's a reality of life. However, direct care staff, she ends with by saying, direct care staff who provided services for me conveyed to me that my aspirations to climb back into a comfortable lifestyle were grandiose and unattractively ambitious. Mike Hogan, who several of you uh, might know, he um, was in New York State as the commissioner. Before that, he was the commissioner of um, the Ohio Department of Mental Health. Uh, many years ago, he was the chair of, of what was considered the what was known as the President's Commission on Mental Health. And when he talked about the vision of recovery, he talked about increasing employment for people in mental illness is one of the most urgent priorities in today's mental health system. That's a quote from a brochure from the Ohio Employment Leadership Alliance brochure. What I don't have is the date. The date of that brochure is 1993. So in 28 years, that figure that I showed you that is now 23.6% of adults in the mental health system having any kind of employment, basically moved from about 16.5%. So it's moved up, but when you, when you consider the, the economic boom, the, the, the um, stock market boom, 
over the last 28 years, the way the economy has progressed over the last 28 years, the way unemployment has basically come down with that blur, with that blip from the pandemic where we're really up and then 2008, that uh, great recession. The reality is we've hardly moved at all when we think about this being one of the greatest priorities and most urgent priorities. So here's some examples from the, uh, those epidemiological studies. This goes back, the first one I could find was 1938. So we're not talking about a recent finding. Uh, unemployment tends to make people more emotionally unstable than they were previous to unemployment. That goes, once again, 1938, this was written in a, an old out of, out of um, press uh, news uh, uh, magazine called the Psychological Bulletin, which is now kind of morphed into psych psychiatric services. Two thousand and six. Uh, you know, the question in the article was: Is work good for your health and well-being, or finding and keeping work issues for those with mental health needs? Uh, it's obviously a long article. But here, here's what it, they basically find. And once again, if I have the references, so feel free to read the whole article. Being in the right type of work, which is important, is good for health, quality of life, and self-esteem. People who are long-term unemployed have more sickness, disability, obesity, use meds more, use more medical services, decrease life expectancy. Returning to work after unemployment, this is interesting, improves health, by as much as unemployment damages it. So it's not a lost cause. So if long-term unemployment in fact has a negative impact that's deleterious to a person's physical and mental health, returning to work can in fact begin to help people improve. These are several articles that talk about, um, uh, for this first article talks a lot about uh, that a uh, longer duration of poverty and unemployment is a risk factor for heavy drinking. Uh, it talks about recovery was influenced by employment and poverty. Another article talks about that, that if you were poor, this is not too surprising. If you were poor prior to disability acquisition, uh, you have a greater deterioration in mental health than among those with higher wealth. I think we know that. Uh, this article from 2014, and from Australia, talks about a greater reduction in mental health for those persons with disabilities who are unemployed or economically inactive than for those who were employed. Steady employment is associated with reduced use of mental health services. There was um, an article, this is an old article 12 years ago, but it, there's been some follow-up. Basically, this particular article talks about uh, $166,000 of lower cost of mental health services for people who worked over 10 years. I think what you find when you look at the use of employed people for mental health services, what you tend to find is that they use fewer mental health services. And when you do some qualitative interviews, the reason they do that is not necessarily because they feel that much better, but to some extent it is, but to some extent it's because people are doing other things with their time than using mental health services. So from a, a policy point of view, the figure about saving med medical costs or what we call in the United States Medicaid costs is very important. It's an important uh, uh, policy outcome. But I think for an individual, the real concern is that there are other parts of their life that they're paying attention to other than purely uh, getting services from the mental health system. When I was the deputy director of, of the largest mental health center in Washington state, I'd get to work pretty early. And frankly, I was always uh, depressed because I, I, our, our clinic opened at eight o'clock and there'd be a line of people around 7.30 when I'd get in waiting to get in. Now, on one hand, that was good. We had services that people valued. On the other hand, that was a concern because I'm thinking, why, why is this 7.30 in the morning the major need that people have in their life to use mental health services, that we need to do a better job? And, uh, 
you know, at some stage we were successful and certainly not as successful as we wanted to be. Uh, one of the issues is, is that mental health affects future employment as job loss affects mental health. So the pure mental health attributable to both the impact of unemployment and to existing mental health problems. So basically, I don't want to minimize the fact that sometimes people's psychiatric status or mental health status does in fact make it harder for them to get a job. That's why we have things like support and employment. That's why we have support services. So I, I don't, when I say that unemployment is worse for you than employment is good for you, I don't mean that the only thing that resonates with your mental health status is whether you're employed or not. What I do mean is that being unemployed a longer time is a kind of, of, of problem and, and risk factor that we do a poorer job with than we do around symptom reduction or med management. Often people need a lot of things, but employment is one of the things that we do the worst at and long-term unemployment we don't hear enough talk about once again as a clinical risk factor. When I was the deputy director of the mental health center I mentioned in Washington state, one of my goals was to beef up employment services. And one of the things we did was to move our employment staff. We had two employment staff when they started. At the end of two years, we had 23 employment staff. That was really important. We provided more resources for employment. Practically speaking, in terms of my changing the attitude within the mental health system about employment, I didn't spend too much time with my employment staff because that the person who ran it was good and I had a good employment staff. I spent most of my time with the clinicians, with the doctors, with the nurses, with the crisis team. Some of the best discussions we had about the risks of long-term unemployment with the crisis team. So when I talk about long-term unemployment as a clinical risk factor, and I talk about systems, I'm not just talking about adding a few employment staff. I'm not just talking about doing evidence-based support and employment and what you know as IPS. I'm talking about how do you get the clinical teams more engaged in the helping people avoid long-term unemployment. And we're probably at the stage in the world in most places, not every place, at least in the US, where if a client says, I want a job, that there's a reasonable amount of support at some level to say, okay, let's see what we can do to help you. What I'm talking about is for the 80% of people or the 60% of people that aren't concerned that right now they say they're not the best time getting a job. I'm not ready to work right now that clinicians begin to discuss with them the greater risk they're taking for their physical and mental health by remaining unemployed. Uh, here's some more uh, articles. You can see this is from relatively recent one, 2016, 2017. Unemployment is a source of adult and youth mental distress and of economic hardship, and it changes of the way people are able to relate to their families. Uh, the results in this particular article from Scandinavia in 2016 talk about this one, in fact, talks about a causal link between unemployment and poverty status and subsequent health, health status. But obviously, there are issues about what's called the research selected by, selection bias, like who exactly was, was, was uh, interviewed in these discussions. Uh, this particular article from 2017 uh, basically interviewed 71 participants. Uh, the majority were in the community and two areas of community integration emerged as a problem. Even though they were living in the community, these 71, this was a qualitative set of interviews. They were basically satisfied with their living arrangements but they weren't satisfied with quote unquote being productive or being close to someone that is working or having relationships. Once again, I certainly understand from a philosophical point of view, there's a difference between being productive and working. You can be productive without having a paid job. It's inescapable though, to come to the conclusion that most adults in our society and in many societies are certainly in Western societies, see paid employment as a major vehicle to productivity when you're a working age adult. Certainly there are other societies that have different views of productivity, but in those societies, frankly, being productive is essentially what takes the place of paid work. It's not, as in the United States, something we might say is, well, they're not working, but they're productive. 
in the societies where, where there isn't as much paid employment, the, the sense of being productive in terms of value to the tribe or to the local community is really the, 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 the equivalent of paid work. And once again, for in terms of people uh, taking care of a family, being, a, being a, a, a stay-at-home mom or dad, being a quote-unquote homemaker, that's considered a, work, a job that has economic value. Uh, this is an interesting slide from, this is not a research thing. This is a slide from a group that was training physicians in Arizona years ago, talking about clinical decision-making. And it was labeled practical stuff they didn't teach you in medical school. And there's several things here about sort of taking a holistic view. But what's interesting is they talk about, even in this slide, which is geared for physicians, I'm talking about uh, training physicians, the loss of work causes anxiety, depression, loss of self-worth, threatens identity. They talk about, they, they, the Webability Corporation, this set of slides, talks about unemployment as a clinical risk factor. This book from 1987, let me get this out of the way here. Yeah. This is a whole book, it's not an article, but to some extent it summarizes, it's now uh, 33 years old. It basically summarizes what pretty much most of those articles from, 2000, from 1938 through 2018, uh, 2020 actually, you'll see in those reference lists, Basically, this summarizes what are some of the side effects of unemployment in the general population. Increased substance abuse, reduced self-esteem, loss of social contacts, alienation and apathy, increased psychiatric disorders, and increased physical problems. Now, if I'm a clinical director in a community mental health center, or if I'm a, 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 a state or a, a federal governmental official in charge of mental health policy, and I'm saying... What's a social condition that increases clinical risk for the population we serve in terms of this issues, putting people more at risk for substance abuse, for losing social uh, relationships, for alienation apathy, for greater physical or psychiatric disorders, for lowering self-esteem? I would say this is a crisis issue. If, in fact, the fact that over 76%, over three quarters of the population in our adult mental health system in the United States, and it's not much different internationally, in fact, have this condition, have this situation of putting themselves at greater risk for these areas, why are we not doing something about it? This is a serious clinical crisis. It's not just a social or an economic crisis, it's a clinical crisis. I talk about, and this is also in your handout, you hear a lot of talk about motivational interviewing. What I try to get people to think about is to think about motivationally enhancing environments. And I'm not going to go through each of these things, but what you'll see in that handout is this little overly simplified view of contrasting, just focusing on motivational interviewing, which as good as it is, and what a wonderful intervention it is, is essentially totally focused on helping the person change their behavior. I want you to think about how do you help the organization create a motivationally enhancing environment so that, in fact, people can put themselves less at risk for long-term unemployment. How do you deal, number one, with the people who say they're interested in employment? How, in fact, do you produce interventions that give them a greater chance of succeeding in employment? And for the greater numbers of people who say, right now, I'm not ready for employment, I'm not interested in employment, how do you, in fact, begin to influence them to get them, if nothing else, to understand the dangerous situation they're willingly entering into by not dealing with long-term unemployment. One way, I don't want to get into this here, but uh, I, I just want to mention, one of the, one of the ways I've helped people uh, think this through is to essentially say, think about, you've all very often heard about the quadrant approach in terms of people with co-occurring disorder, substance abuse or mental health or um, physical issues and mental health issues. And I want you to take a quadrant approach to employment. Think about people who have 
high or low support needs in mental health and people who have highest or low support needs in employment. Some of those people have very high support needs in both employment and mental health, need something like evidence-based support and employment, which you see in the upper right side here. Uh, what's called IPS, Individualized Placement and Support, popularized by people from Dartmouth and now Westat. But there are other kinds of employment needs that could be attended to based on the levels of support they need either in employment or in clinical areas. Some people may need a lot of mental health support but very little employment support. Some people may need a lot of employment support but very little clinical support. So there are various resources that we need to think people uh, can can access and help people access, whether that's our, our Department of Labor system in the United States, our workforce centers, whether that's our public vocational rehabilitation system, whether that's looking for jobs on their own, doing through networking, whether that's direct job placement, whether that's supported employment. Um, Kevin Martone, who's the head of an organization called the Technical Assistance Collaborative, or TAC, with formerly the director of mental health in New Jersey, said a man with schizophrenia once told him he could cope with the voices in his head. But it was the poverty, the unemployment, the homelessness, the fact that he was going to die 25 years sooner than the general population. Those were the big issues for him. So, you know, why has it been so hard to move employment into community mental health practice? Let me just, uh... Partly because people don't do these suggestions. These are very simple, to some extent, overly simplified suggestions, which if you have any questions, we can talk more about. But here are, are five very specific kinds of suggestions. Number one, we need to prioritize employment outcomes concurrently with housing within recovery-oriented mental health systems of care. They're not prioritized uh, around our, certainly our US mental health system. We need to identify the treatment of long-term unemployment as significant clinical risk factor, similar on plans to crisis management and discharge planning. When I was a deputy director of, of a large mental health center, I required all clinicians, if someone was unemployed longer than three months, to put something about dealing with long-term unemployment clinically on every service plan, whether that's the person was interested, we might start right away helping them get a job. If they weren't interested, we obviously wouldn't push them into employment, but we would talk about how do we help them deal with long-term unemployment. From our state funding levels, we need to include more, uh, the ability to provide things like support and employment, and that's kind of a technical issue. Uh, I think there should be ways of both incentivizing employment, but more importantly, we need to add sanctions for people who don't deal with employment and dealing with long-term unemployment. And we also need to do a better job of, of linking with generic systems like vocational rehabilitation or the workforce systems. I'm gonna skip this. And let, let me end, because it's eight foot. Let, let me end and then we'll have some questions with this. From an individual point of view, how do you help people change? And what I like to think about is there's only three ways or three interventions that everybody needs to change. People need a sense of hope. People need some concrete help. And people need some hassling at some level. People need to get out of their comfort zone. And when I contrast hope versus optimism, I think about optimism or shallow optimism is just keeping a pat on the back and saying, oh, I know you could do it. And if someone's had a lot of problems, if someone's had a lot of failures in life, it doesn't help just to say, I know you could do it. When you're really going to be hopeful to people, you communicate, you care, you understand, you'll be there, and you have ideas and help to offer. And I contrast help, which is giving people what you think they need, versus support, which is giving people what they want. And sometimes you need to do both, but always know the difference. Help is giving people what you think they need. Support is giving people what they want. Uh, before I take some questions, think about Billie Holiday, who was an old blues singer from the 30s and 40s who said you need a little love in your life and some food in your stomach before you can still hold still for some damn fool's lecture about how to behave. I have some ending quotes, but I want to see if there's any questions first. So let's see on the chat box. Yeah, Joe, I've been, um, well, first, Joe, I have to apologize. I mispronounced your last name. It's Maroney, not Marone. So 
um, being being Gretchen Grappone, not Gretchen Grappone, it's important for me to acknowledge that. Sorry about that. Um, but we did have a few questions come in and I'll just take them in the order that they came in. The first question is, besides the financial aspect, how would the outcome be different between volunteering and working? Well, and I said, the, the, uh, I think you need to treat it as a social policy versus for lack of a better word, clinical. I'm using the term clinical broadly. Oh, um, the um, for any individual that you or anybody's working with, I think it. A lot of people say, uh, "I'd like to volunteer. I want to give something back, or I want to try." It's a little. Uh, uh, I have a friend who's volunteering and gets a lot of satisfaction from it. It's also from a, a sort of a broader clinical point of view. Uh, it's very helpful for people who are a recipient of a service to feel empowered to give something back. It's just that it's not the same when I'm a, a, a mental health system of care or I'm an employment system and I want to help people get back into the economic fabric of society. Counting volunteering as employment is, is, is misconstruing what's going on. So I, there's nothing wrong with volunteering. It's just not employment. I think ultimately what we find is that long-term unemployment is what's deleterious to a person's physical and mental health. And as you know, from maybe your own life or lots of people's lives, there are a lot of people, including me, and I assume, as I said, many of you, who both work and volunteer in something not associated with work. So that's the distinction. It's not so much, both can be good for you, but it's just that one's, I think, a good, from, from an individual decision, a good uh, kind of clinical step that you may or may not want to take, but from a social policy outcome orientation, that's not the same as changing the direction of the long-term unemployment that we see in the statistics. Thank you. Next question is uh, from a participant that's from Tanzania who says that um, there just isn't enough awareness um, of this issue in, where, where he's from and he says he has a disability and um, he and his colleagues who are also have disabilities run an NGO and they're wondering about if you know of any support like small grants or, or any anything at the international level that you could um, point them to. Uh, no, not um, particularly. Certainly the, the World Health Organization has published a lot of statistics about it. Um, you know, about unemployment and poverty and mental health. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, the UN uh, has grants. U.S., uh, from the U.S. point of view, the Agency for, for uh, International Development is called USAID. Um, the European Union has done a lot, but I, you know, I certainly can't tell you right off the cuff about very specific uh, uh, grants that might uh, relate to people in Africa right now. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's obviously an issue. Funding, particularly for, for uh, countries that have, um, uh, you know, not a strong, uh, uh, you know, social support network or human service network. Although, as I said, countries in, in you know, the U.S. and Canada, which have very strong social service networks and, and uh, uh, human service networks still are tackling this uh, and don't necessarily do as good a job as they can. So I, I don't think I'm going to be that helpful right now, except the obvious with uh, things like the World Health Organization and the UN and UNESCO. Great. Next question. Um, dare you to answer this one, Joe. When will the USA force people, force companies to hire people with mental illness? In Europe, companies are forced to do this, um, but in the USA, um, people have to compete with quote-unquote yeah. normal people. Yeah, well, there's, there's two answers to that. One, I don't think you'll see it in the U.S. ever because of our political structure. Um, I think what you're seeing more, and I'll just talk about the U.S., but I'll also talk about Europe. What you're seeing more in the U.S. Um, is more emphasis uh, on the fact that mental health is, in fact, a, a disability. You know, legally, it's covered by the, the uh, disability protections we do have in the U.S., including some of the, the what we call affirmative action protections. But those tend to be more robust uh, at the helping people keep their job level than at the job acquisition level for a variety of reasons. 
Uh, so I, I think you're not never going to see, or let me see in my lifetime, you're never going to see the U.S. political environment force people to hire anyone with uh, private companies to hire anybody with a uh, physical or mental disability. You are seeing an increasing emphasis on understanding psychiatric disability as part of the constellation. I'd say in other countries like, uh, for example, Japan or in Europe, there's often a lot of like quota systems. However, when you look at those systems, what you find is often companies would rather pay the fines than actually do the hiring. And there really isn't a lot of, um, of strong data. Certainly it has had some impact in some countries. There isn't a lot of strong data that creates a, a um, that creating a quota system for different disability labels necessarily improves hiring all that much at a, at a system level. Great. And our last question to round out our webinar today. Prior to COVID, not being able to leave home for work was seen as a barrier and a sign of being unemployable. With the new normal, will there be more opportunities for some with mental health challenges to gain employment and be able to attend to their mental health needs while working at home? Yeah, I, um, I think there's good news and bad news with, with you know, the post-COVID economic environment. The good news is it, it's, it's a, a job applicant's market now. You know, there's certainly a lot of opportunities. Employers, I just recently, the U.S. average wage for, for uh, you know, basically entry-level jobs has inched over $15 an hour, which is still, you know, not a lot of money comparatively, but it, it's a lot better than it used to be. So the good news is there's, there's more economic opportunity. In terms of the, the, the two caveats with that, in terms of the specific question, the... There are going to be a lot more work from home jobs. As you can tell from the statistics, those tend, tend to be very much white collar jobs, uh, tend to be actually uh, uh, concentrated in the higher pay professions. So I think for people whose only barrier, let me say, is, is the idea about kind of being out of the house or connecting with a lot of people, I think that's going to open up. But for people we entering the job market after a long time. It's just entering the job market. A lot of those white collar jobs aren't going to necessarily be available to them. The negative, the other negative part, not related to telecommuting or, or work from home, is that a lot of the increase in jobs that you see in the labor market in the U.S. and I assume what you're going to be seeing in other parts of the world are for entry level, you know, supermarket, uh, delivery, warehouse jobs, jobs that are not necessarily the greatest jobs. So they're, because of the need, they tend to be paying more and they'll often come with benefits with five years ago, they didn't come with benefits. Where in the United States, having a job with healthcare is an important benefit that may not be as much in Canada or in other parts where they have um, uh, national healthcare. But I think a lot of the 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 opportunities in jobs, not at home, not work from home jobs, but a lot of the big glut of vacant jobs in the U.S. are really an entry level kind of jobs, which I think are a good start for a lot of people, particularly if you're younger. But are not always the most desirable jobs. And as I said, long term unemployment is terrible for you. Every specific job may not be good for you, and some jobs can be very bad for you. Is that it on the questions? That is it. And then let's end with some quotes. Okay, let's do it. Gilead, which is a famous novel by Marilyn Robinson. John Ames was the, the uh, narrator in the novel who said it. Probably been boring people, a lot of people for a long time. Strange to find comfort in that idea. There have always been things I felt I must tell them, even if no one listened or understood. That's kind of the way I feel now at the age of 74. There's an old Yiddish proverb that says, if one person calls you a jackass, ignore him. If a second person calls you a jackass, think about it. And if a third person calls you a jackass, get a saddle. And finally, if anybody ever likes anything I say, I always remember this Mark Twain quote. There's nothing you can say in answer to a compliment. I've been complimenting myself a great many times, and they always embarrass me. I always feel they have not said enough. So anyway, thank you all for attending. Uh, you have Gretchen's contact. She put the uh, handouts in the chat box, I'm assuming. Yep. And you have my, uh, my contact and email. So if you have anything you wanted to say, good or bad offline, feel free to call me or berate me over my uh, message line at my cell phone. Thank, thank you. you very much. 
Thank you so much, Joe. And, and I'll be sending out um, an evaluation for this for everyone. So please give us your feedback. And we thank you all for attending. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye.